I'm going to argue that there's a conception of knowledge which is needed to understand human agency and that it's missing from the desire-belief theory of action. I've argued in the past against the so-called standard story of action developed from the desire-belief theory. But in the past, I've been concerned for the most part with <coughs> metaphysical claims to which those who tell the standard story commit themselves. Today, I want to take issue with a different aspect of it, an epistemological one. If you look at some of the headings on the handout, you'll see that a doctrine I call propositionalism will be in my sights today. Propositionists claim that our intentional states of mind have propositions as their objects. They think that whether one believes something or knows something or hopes for something or intends something, one's belief or knowledge or hope or intention can be represented as having a proposition as its object. What one believes or knows or hopes or intends is, according to the propositionist, as we say, that P. Since this is a lecture in philosophy of action, and since I want to say something about the knowledge involved in action, the intentional states of mind I'm mainly going to be concerned with are intending and knowing how. I can start to say why one m might want to think that the knowledge involved in, ac in action, think about the knowledge involved in action by allusion to what's called knowledge first epistemology. Tim Williamson is famous, among other things, for defending this. The knowledge first epistemologist says, and I agree, that knowledge is primary, meaning that an epistemologist may use the concept of knowledge in understanding other concepts, such as belief, but ought not to expect to understand knowledge in terms of other concepts, such as belief. One good reason that Williamson has for saying this is the impossibility of providing an analysis of knowledge in terms of belief and other things. We should not think that what it is for a person to know something is, on the one hand, for that person to be some way internally, and on the other hand, for the world external to her to be as it is, and then, in addition, for what's internal and what's external to be suitably matched up. When this is accepted, one can have an attractive view of mind-world relations. So, for instance, you can allow that your perceptual experience, which gives you knowledge of things you can see, can itself be experience of mind-independent objects. Now, if the knowledge-first epistemologist provides an attractive view of our standing as thinkers, there can be a question whether knowledge-first epistemology might provide an attractive view of our standing as agents. Someone who subscribes to the desire-belief theory of action apparently doesn't take a knowledge-first view. The desire-belief theory says that agents have beliefs which, in concert with their desires, cause their actions. No mention is made of knowledge. Still, one might think that when all is well, someone who believes that some means is a means to an end she has is someone who knows how to achieve her end. So then one might wonder whether, in an account of what it is for someone to be an agent, the idea of her knowing how to do something might serve better than the idea of her having a means-end belief. Well, that's something I've been wondering about, and I've come to think that one does well to give knowledge a prominent role in an account of human agency. Of course, if knowledge entails belief, then giving knowledge a prominent role won't put belief beyond the pale, Still, if an attractive view is got by giving knowledge a prominent role, then perhaps it should be given one. So now let me look in turn at the idea of a means end belief and the idea of knowledge how to do something. The handout contains a quotation from Michael Smith, which presents the desire belief theory or standard story of action. I should say the standard story comes in many versions, but none of the details is going to matter for my purposes. So, Smith says, when desires for ends and means end beliefs combine to cause and rationalise bodily movements in a certain way, then those bodily movements count as actions of the agent. 
Smith isn't explicit about what a means end belief is. One might ask both about the content of such a belief and how such a belief is supposed to operate. It's not easy to find any general account of means end beliefs in the literature. So the phrase means end belief is used a great deal, but most people who use it don't say, i.e., a belief on the following pattern. Anyway, I lighted on one. If I adopt <coughs> means M, then I will achieve end E. That's from Goldman. And I assume that those who speak of means end beliefs would go along with something like it. Goldman resorted to the first person. But, of course, he didn't mean to tell us just of his very own means-end beliefs. So, speaking generally, I take it the idea is that someone who has a means-end belief has a belief concerning means that she herself might adopt, adopting which would be her achieving her end. As for how means-end beliefs might be supposed to operate, that's a topic of its own. But if one goes back to Davidson, who first told the standard story, one finds that such a belief is about an action, and it's about an action that does not exist until it has been caused by that belief. Perhaps that strikes you as at least strange. I think it is strange, but I'm not going to tell you what I think is wrong with it, because that would be to tell you about the metaphysical errors I find in the standard story of action and I promised you epistemology, not metaphysics. <laughs> On then to knowing how. But one can't s so much as start on the subject of knowing how without encountering controversy. The controversy concerns how knowing how is understood. The question might crudely be put as a choice between two things that I put on the handout. In instances of the first, A knows how to phi, a genuinely infinitival phrase is a genuine component of the sentence, and A is joined to what the phrase applies to by knows how. In instances of the second, how to phi is a component in its own right, and it applies to something to which A relates by the simple no. How to phi here then? needs to be glossed so as to obtain a sentence expressing a proposition known by A. How to find might be replaced by of some way or ways that it or they are ways of fine. A gloss of just this sort is, by, is given by those whose views of know-how are based on their semantic theory. And these people are intellectualists in the sense that Gilbert Ryle gave to that word. They say that to know how to do something is to know a truth about the world. You'll see that on the handout I've distinguished between the, the two understandings of know how to, according as the first is endorsed by Ryle, the second by intellectualists. In opposing intellectualism, Ryle set himself against philosophers who thought that the capacity to attain knowledge of truths was the defining property of mind. His anti-intellectualism certainly wasn't set against 21st century theses in semantics, as the, de as the defense of the intellectualism I presented on the handout is. So what was Ryle driving at? I think it helps here to take account of the fact that there are two ways of hearing she knows how to do something. The difference between them can be brought out by considering what someone may want to know if he asks someone else whether she knows how to do something. So he says to her, do you know how to do such and such? Two other different things might be going on. On the one hand, he may seek information about how the thing in question can be done. Perhaps he wants to do it himself, and if she knows how to, she can tell him what he needs to know. On the other hand, it may be that he wants to learn whether she has the knowledge in question. There's probably a case of the first sort, in which in asking his question he seeks facts about how something can be done, if he asks her, do you know how to get to the station? But if he asks her, do you know how to swim? Then it's more likely that he wants to find out whether she knows how to swim. 
he needn't have any interest in how swimming can or may be done. The distinction between cases of the two sorts points up a difference that one can mark between knowing how something can be done and knowing how to do the thing oneself. It was knowledge a person has of how to do something herself, which was of concern to Ryle. An example may help to bring out the idea of such knowledge. Someone asks you how to get to the refectory. If she can easily walk there, then you'd answer by telling her a walkable route, up the stairs maybe. But if the person who asks you this is in a wheelchair, then you'll tell her a route a wheelchair user could take, with ramps and elevators perhaps. In either case, you hope to convey facts, knowledge of which combines with capacities she already possesses, to walk, to manoeuvre her wheelchair, which would enable her to get to the refectory herself. You take her perspective. Knowing that she's not interested simply in how the refectory can be got to, you want to ensure that she knows what's needed for her to come to know how to get to the refectory herself. Ryle must have been concerned with what a person knows by virtue of which she can do things herself because he thinks of knowledge how it's used by a person in practice. Ryle spoke of the exercises of knowing how as deeds, overt or covert. And he spoke of our activities as displaying qualities of our minds directly. In Ryle's view, someone who's actually doing something puts her knowledge how to do it on display. It may be manifest that she has knowledge how to do it insofar as her doing it is her exercising her knowledge how to do it. I take it that Ryle thought that you can't see someone doing something without being in the position to find it apparent that she knows how to do whatever it is. Well, the intellectualists think that Ryle is wrong. They tell us that a person who knows how to do something therein knows a proposition. So they participate in a version of the propositionalism that I mentioned at the start. The propositionalist says that intentional states of mind can always be represented as having a proposition as their contents. Well, why should anyone think that? Some philosophers take themselves to have reasons to think it. So I come now to motivations for propositionalism. Some philosophers endorse propositionalism in consequence of taking a certain view in philosophy of mind. It's a view about how the mind's to be accommodated in a physical world. In the view of these philosophers, the attitudes are states of mind which play causal roles. They're roles to be spelled out in a certain sort of theoretical account. These philosophers say that in explaining interactions between any subject of the attitudes and the world beyond her body, the attitudes must be attributed contents and explanations of subjects' interactions with the world must advert the relations among those contents. If a systematic account is to be reached of the causal cause-effect relations, which, as they suppose, the attitudes enter into, then uniformity of the objects of the states of mind seems to them to be key. And then, if proposition is the word for what someone believes or hopes, what a known or intended or expected or disliked must also be propositions. That's a general propositionism. When it comes to intention, the supposition that there's a propositional object has a different source. Now the source is a line of thinking about practical reasoning, about reasoning which comes to an end with the subjects having a certain intention. John Broom, in developing his account of practical reasoning, makes something out of the point that an agent may express her intention by saying, I will fi. In Broom's hands, the claim that the object of any intention is a proposition is then got from a quick argument and an assumption. <coughs> so first, Broom's argument. Someone who says, I will fi, can always be given a name, call her Chris. So the object of Chris's intention, which she expresses when she says, I will fi, is the proposition 
that Chris will fly. And now for Broom's stated assumption. He writes, an infinitive and a that clause are alternative ways of expressing a proposition. So if the argument and the assumption are in place, we can be sure that if we find ourselves saying that Chris intends to do something, we actually express the very proposition that Chris expresses if he says either I will do whatever it is or I intend to do whatever it is. I should say, Broom is far from alone in thinking that we intend propositions. You'll see David Vellerman's name on the handout. Vellerman has a completely different view from Broom's about the nature of intention, but he also thinks that intentions must have propositional objects, as presumably do all of those who are led to propositionalism by their view in the philosophy of mind. Well, I've mentioned two sources of, of a propositionist view. One is writ large in much philosophy of mind, and the other dominates much philosophy of action. I'll come back to them both. But before I do, I want to look critically at the proposition about intention that one finds in Broom and others, and also the propositionalism of the intellectualists which you'll remember as a propositionalism specifically about know-how. In my opinion, propositions about intention has nothing going for it. I think that it must be that people are able to intend to do things of a kind that they can do. If that weren't so, it wouldn't seem possible that anyone should ever do anything. It's useful now to have a word for the things we both do and may intend to do, say that they are acts. My claim then is that given that acts are what we do, necessarily sometimes what we intend are acts. And granted that we usually follow the word intend with an infinitive, we might assume that usually what we, usually what we intend are acts. Not only it must be that sometimes, but actually, usually. So, if I intend to stop on time, then stop on time specifies an act that I intend, and not any proposition. If that's right, then there's something wrong with Broome's account. So, two points about it. The first point concerns what one actually says if one follows up the word intend with the word that. So think about what you'll say if you take Broom's part. Instead of saying what comes naturally, Chris intends to go home, you'll say Chris intends that something or other. But what exactly is the something or other? Won't you say Chris intends that he go home? The go here of go home is a subjunctive. And that means that the that clause you've come out with is actually not a propositional clause. At least it isn't on the usual view according to which propositions are truth evaluable. If Broom wants us to substitute intend a proposition for intend an act, then he wants us to stop speaking English. If there's to be something truth evaluable following intends that, the indicative, not the subjunctive, is needed. So I think that casts doubt on Broom's assumption. I won't go on about it. Um, it's slightly complicated, partly because English inflects so relatively little that uh, it, it's hard to uh, find cases where it's obvious there's a difference. But anyway, there's another point which is at least as important. And this relates now to Broom's argument. Broom assumes that if Chris has a propositional intention concerning what Chris will do, then Chris has an intention to do it. And an example will show that this isn't so. So now for the case of Alfrig. Alfrig's a very powerful man with a finger in many pies. Alfrig intends that the chair of the board of management speak to the regent. 
But such is Alfred's dominance that he's forgotten who the chairs are of all the boards. Luckily, as he thinks, Alfred's office wall is adorned with labelled photographs of all the important people. And he can see a photograph labelled Chair of the Board of Management. So Alfred now decrees he that, ma he, that man, shall speak to the regent. What Alfred doesn't realise, however, is that the photograph he sees is actually a photograph of himself. So now Alfred intends that he, that man, should speak to the regent, and actually that man is Alfred. Nonetheless, Alfred doesn't intend to speak to the regent. Not knowing that he himself is chair of the board of management, Alfred retains the propositional, supposedly propositional intention that the chair of the board of management speak to the regent, but he lacks the intention to speak to the regent. Only if it should dawn on Alfred that he's chair of the board of management will he come to intend to speak to the regent, or he'll come to intend that if he's not lazy, forgetful, has reasons not to speak to the regent himself, whatever. The example, I think, shows that Broom is just wrong to assume <coughs> that an intention of Chris's, that Chris do something, is an intention of Chris's to do the thing. The example, perhaps, shows something else. Perhaps it explains why someone who tells the standard story of action should introduce the first person in saying what a means end belief is. If I adopt means end, then I will achieve my end E. If one leaves the first person out of this, one has adopting means end will achieve end E. But of course, sorry, that adopting means M will achieve end E can, of course, be something an agent believes. But an agent's believing it won't, on its own, immediately explain her adopting means M. Means M. In order to explain why she adopts means M, we have to think of her as believing that she herself can achieve ND by Ming herself. If an agent's credited not with a means end belief in respect of E, but with knowledge how to achieve E, then there's no use, need to use herself in saying what she knows. As we've seen, there's an understanding of she knows how to do such and such, in which herself is just implicit. So you might think she knows how to do it only if she herself knows how to do it himself. Indeed, you might but there's no need for anyone to say this, not in the ordinary way. I've suggested that both in intending something and in knowing how to do something, a person may be related to an act. If someone actually did something that she knew how to do, then there'd be something, some act, which she knew how to do and which she did. If someone actually will do something that she intends to do, then there's something, some act she intends, which she will have done and might be doing even now. I assume that no one will deny that there's a connection between knowledge how and action. And indeed, the very authors who started the intellectualist campaign against Ryle said, we do find it very plausible that intentional actions are employments of knowledge how. So that was Stanley and Williamson speaking in 2001. Um, and their article gave rise to an enormous amount of literature under the head of knowing how to. What Stanley and Williamson find very plausible is formulated with a schema. So it's on the handout with an asterisk at its front. If A intentionally fies, then A knows how to fie. I'm going to call this star, and I'm going to suggest that the very plausible star actually gives Ryle, the anti-intellectualist, the advantage. So I start with two points. The first concerns the letter S, the S, which marks an inflection on the schematic verb phi. 
I should say I've got phi here um, where the Stanley and Williamson version has f. I think using phi helps to alert one to the fact that instance of it are verbs, not just any old predicates. Anyway, so the, the little s which comes after the phi in the antecedent of star, I take it introduces the simple present tense. It's third person, we've got a as subject. So suppose phi is sweep the floor. Then on the left-hand side, we have she intentionally sweeps the floor. But the most likely reading of such a sentence is habitual. Perhaps she intentionally sweeps the floor every Tuesday. And I take it that's not what's meant, or at least it's not that they want to formulate something such that only habituals fit in. Presumably, the little s is meant to be understood somehow generically as a sort of dummy inflection. So someone who is fying knows how to fi, and someone who fied or was fying knew how to fi, and someone who will fi, will or just as likely does, know how to fi. So my second point about it relates to what makes star compelling. If A couldn't know how to fi, then she could never intentionally fi. We can't digest our food intentionally, for instance, and the reason is that digesting our food is something one doesn't know how to do. Say, for examples of things that one can't do intentionally, phi, suitably tensed, can be replaced with verb phrases of lesser or greater complexity and of lesser or greater contextual dependence. Instances of phi might be swam or is travelling from an address on one side of the world to an address on the other using seven different modes of transport, or placed your cup down on that table. So star captures the thought that the acts that any person ever is or was or will be doing are properly included among those she knows how to do, or knew, or. What these two points bring home is that star registers something universal about the domain of human agency and about precisely that domain. What star makes vivid is that in doing something oneself, one counts on knowing how to do it. And notice that one doesn't count on knowing how to produce the unintended side effects of things one does, not even if, de facto, one does know how to produce them. Of course, no one could count on knowing how to do anything herself unless she knew many facts. But if one's inclined to think that Star's correct, then that would seem to be because one allows that the knowledge attributed to A and its consequent is caught up with A's acting in a way that it couldn't be if it were knowledge just of facts, just of how fine can be done. Um, that such and such or so and so are ways in which one can fi. So this, I think, is why star plays into Ryle's hands. It's small wonder that someone who's doing something intentionally should know how to do it if she's exercising, doesn't merely possess, knowledge she has of how to do it. Which I can say is knowledge how to do it herself. So my question was about intending rather than about intentionally doing. I've moved to intentionally doing just because Stan William Williamson, as it seems to me, without realising, take the wrong side. But the connection with knowing how remains even when one moves from intentionally doing to my principal concern, intending. An immediate connection shows up if it's allowed that one who is fying intentionally, intends to be fying. But something more general can be said. It's true that someone may intend to do something in consequence of some delusion, and true that the undeluded may never do something that they intend to do, whether through forgetfulness or weakness or a change of mind about its desirability. 
It's true also perhaps that someone may intend to do something but not yet know exactly how to. But someone who intends but doesn't know how to do something can be expected to come to know. One can't intend to do something believing that one will never know how to do it. It's no sort of accident that the acts that it's possible to intend are those that one can know how to do oneself, given that their acts knowledge how to do oneself is needed for doing. That's to say, acts which might figure in actual instances of star. Well, much of what I've said couldn't be right if propositionism were true. So before I come to a close, let me look again at propositionalism's motivations. I think not only that there aren't good reasons for endorsing propositionalism, but also that those who do endorse it base it in mistaken thinking of their own. The first motivation for proposition was a motivation for a very general propositionalism. It was grounded in a doctrine about how the mind should be seen if it's to accommodate it in a physical world. The assumption introduced in order to conform to the doctrine is that mental states, all of them, are sometimes causes, sometimes effects, and that the causation in question in these cause-effect relations is, as one writer puts it, not foreign to science. Well, if it's allowed that the kind of causality in play when in, an intentional agent is at work in the world is not the kind of causality in which scientists most interest themselves, then there must be a different way of accommodating mind to the world that we inhabit. I've said that I'm not going to um, attempt any arguments on the purely metaphysical front, but I take it that this is a point at which a certain metaphysics is seen to stand in the way of a certain sort of account of agency. So the metaphysics leads to the propositionalism and the propositionalism um, uh, interferes with what one might want to say about agency. However that may be, the idea that states of mind, all of them, have a uniform propositional content seems just plain wrong. Consider dislikes. So, X dislikes the Chancellor, Y dislikes it that the Chancellor has the political skills he does, and Z dislikes the way that the Chancellor smiles. X and Y and Z don't simply have different dislikes, their dislikes surely are things in evidently different categories, and only Y's, it was Y who disliked it that the Chancellor has the political skills he does, only wise is in the category of propositions. And one might notice also that X may dislike the Chancellor because the Chancellor has the political skills he does, or he may dislike the, the Chancellor despite the fact that he likes it that the Chancellor has the political skills he does. And Z, who dislikes the way the Chancellor smiles, might or might not find herself apt to dislike others who smile in that way. It's extremely hard to know what a systematic account of the causal relations among dislikes might be. A systematic account of a sort that the general propositionalist envisages is surely impossible. I should say that these propositions would wish to recast the claims about what X, Y, and Z dislike. Um, I'm uh, uh, wanting you to assume that we could take them at face value. We could understand perfectly well that uh, just what I've said about X, Y, and Z could be the truth. Um, there might seem to be a special problem about denying that knowledge how to can be propositional, given its immediate and interconnection and intimate connection with factual knowledge. Um, that's a question which I think speaks to the structure of our mental states 
And I think it's easier to think about when all versions of proposition are out of, out of the way. But I think I'm going to leave that question for discussion. So, question, is there some special problem about thinking that there could be knowledge, which, as it were, comes in two different categories? Um, the knowledge which one has if one knows how to do something, and the knowledge which is of facts. Given that they interrelate so easily, surely we ought to conflate the categories. That, I take it, is the thought. The other motivation, motivation for propositionism, now of a more specific kind, was what I found in philosophers such as Broom and Velleman. They want to see the conclusions of practical reasoning as of like kind with the conclusions of theoretical reasoning. But don't we take ourselves sometimes to reach conclusions of a different kind when we reason practically from those to which theoretical reasoning leads us? Someone engaged in theoretical reasoning has a question to settle. The question, what to think? Someone engaged in practical reasoning has a question to settle. The question, what to do? And reasoning can't always stop with deciding on something as, say, good to do. There can always be the question, how to do it? And that can be the question, how to act? What I've said about intending and know-how and the connection between them allows the language of intention and know-how to be taken at face value. On the face of it, that to which a person relates in intending to do something or in knowing how to do something is given with an infinitival phrase. He intends to read the paper. She knows how to get to the lecture. And infinitives aren't sentences. The infinitive of verb lacks any inflection. It's not bound to a particular subject. A propositional attitude, by contrast, is attributed on the pattern of she, attitude, that, p. And the place of p has to be filled by a sentence. A sentence has a main verb which is inflected, and how it's inflected depends upon its subject. Given that infinitives are subjectless, surface appearances count against thinking of intend and know-how as propositional attitudes. I've relied on that, of course, throughout, but I'm now trying to make it explicit that uh, uh, it's just there on the surface. So surface appearances are contrary to propositionalism, and I trust that I've countered attempts there may be to defend propositionalism. With propositionalism out of the way, the objects of intention and of knowledge how can alike be taken to be acts rather than propositions. I doubt that we'll find that we've much to say using the language of means and beliefs when we have no how to fi at our disposal. At any rate, a story can be told about agency very different from the standard story and it's one in which knowledge rather than belief takes pride of place. And if that's so, then that which was attractive in knowledge first epistemology can be extended to the practical. When someone sees something in the world, the knowledge first epistemologist says that her seeing it is not an interior state in which it merely appears to her that there is something. The thing may come to be within her reach. Well, it would be nice to think that things stay on our reach when we intend to act upon them. It would be nice to think that our powers of action extend by, beyond our bodies and into the world. This is something I want to suggest we can, indeed, ought to think. But if we tell the standard story of action, we may fail to realise that it's something we ordinarily take quite for granted. <laughs> 